Hello everyone and welcome to the initial release of the kinematics module for Eurotic. Uh, this module is really being designed to do uh, exactly what you can see on the center of the screen, which is to simulate something like Simtar, so that we can visualize what the fins would do. You can grab things and move them around. You can start things flipping in order to get an idea of what to expect uh, when you build something. Also, it adds the uh, four bar linkages, which we once had in Gurotic 1, and it allows you to simulate from your own DXFs and shapes that you might create in Gurotic or other programs for that matter, um, to try to come up with uh, various whirly gigs and whiz bang mechanisms that uh, you might be picturing in your mind. Um, but maybe having a bit of trouble visualizing on the screen. So this is a creativity tool, really. Um, let's take a look at it in detail. It's going to take a, a little bit of a video to teach you how to get to the spot that you can do the things that are uh, being shown on the screen at the moment, but I've tried my best to make it as easy as possible. This is a young module. It's full of bugs, and there is a built-in library of shapes that you can load. and. Uh, one of the reasons I'm releasing it early is I'm hoping those of you who use it will uh, contribute to it. You can uh, drop what we're calling mechs, uh, which are small modules. Um, you can drop them on the website and people will be able to download them. Uh, any good ones I will include in the program. You can name them with your name in them if you wish to make yourself famous. And uh, let's take a look at how to build these and see how much fun we can have with them. All right, so the best way to uh, learn how to use kinematics in um, Gerotic is to just start a small project and uh, you might want to follow along with me or watch the video once or twice just to get the idea of what the hell I'm talking about. All right, as we know, Augie is not a great drawing program. Uh, it wasn't designed to be a drawing program at all. It was designed to give you edges and rulers and so on um, that can help a wizard do its job. You can import uh, DXFs, and we can use those shapes as the basis for kinematics, but it's best to learn the process itself from simple shapes. So let's draw, uh, using our square tool, I'm just going to draw a bar. This will exemplify the operation pretty cleanly. We have a bar on the screen. Up here on the toolbar is a new button, picture of a clock, uh, which means that you're going into kinematic simulation. If I press it, You'll notice that the bar I drew now has a center uh, shaft hole to it. Anything that you draw will by default be attached to the background. Let's consider the background, the grid, and everything back there uh, as a wall. So we've pegged this thing to the wall. If I select it, you can see I'm presented with an origin symbol and this um, yellowish black circle out here. This is our center of gravity and this origin symbol is our pivot to the background. Um, you'll notice also other buttons have appeared. There are four bar linkages, gear ratios, pivots, motors, and so on. Let's ignore those for the, min for the moment though and simply hit the play button. When I hit the play button you'll see that the bar I drew starts to swing and it's swinging so that the center of gravity will seek the bottom. Uh, I'll just mention that the gravity in metric is 9,800 millimeters per second squared. And when you're in inch mode, we're going to use about a 386 inches per second squared uh, for the gravity. I'm trying to remain as accurate as I can so that if you design a clock, for example, I want it to tick at the right rate, not based on rules, but based on gravity. Everything that happens here will be based on physics rather than rules. In Gerotic, we base everything on rules rather than physics. So this is a, a shift to a different domain. In order to see what I mean, let's move that center of gravity to the other side. When you see objects on the screen that belong to kinematics, as long as you're in the kinematics mode, in other words, uh, the screen is bluish because the clock is pressed, uh, you can go and grab things. You're, you're uh, pointer will turn into a hand when you're over something and then you can simply drag it. One note when you do this, the red button up here, the stop button, is also a reset button. You should push it before repressing run or if your screen gets screwed up, pressing stop will often redraw it and reset it. So if I now hit the play button, you can see we swing from the opposite direction because our center of gravity has now been shifted. Let's take that further and move our origin over to this side hit the stop button and play. And as you can see, we're now swinging on that pivot.
So this is a very simple example of exactly how uh, you will animate things to make them work. Now, you don't have to be connected to the background. There is a host of properties that you can set for each item. But as you can see, I've set no properties, and yet things work pretty much as you would expect from setting a center of gravity and a pivot. In other words, the default properties are enough for you to rest assured that you're going to get a movement of some sort, whether it agrees with what uh, you're thinking or not, might be a different matter. There's also a button up here next to the stop button which shows a bunch of balls heading off into space. This shows you the first few seconds of each object on the screen. If I press it, you can see what it's telling us is that this bar object will end up going back and forth. It gets more grayed out as it goes in time. The darker ones are the freshest ones to you, and if you look closely, you'll see there are lightish gray ones in the background. This can be valuable information depending on what you're trying to do. This is not the first three seconds of the simulation. This is the first few seconds of each object's movement. Um, more on that later on when we get to the part where that may be important. Um, let's take a look now that we have something swinging um, about how interactions occur and take a brief look at mechs. Over here on the bottom of the screen you'll see a drop box called mechs and in it there are a few objects. More and more will appear here as I add them and these are the things which you can uh, donate to the cause. If you come up with a good mech please uh, post it on the website. I will create a forum just for mechs uh, so that you can show us what you've been doing. But for example, if I select bunch of balls and I hit import button, I've now imported these balls. The screen turned white because it shifted us out of kinematic mode because it knows that we want to do something with these balls. And the message on the screen is mech loaded, paste as you wish. You can now point to wherever you wish, right click and hit paste, and your mechs will appear. So here we have a bunch of balls. Anytime you have a mech, its properties have already been set by the designer of that mech. And mechs are very easy to create and store into your program, as you'll see in a moment. But if I now hit play, you can see that the balls take off. They've been designed not to have a pivot of any sort. So let's try to adapt that a little bit. Let's move our center of gravity to the edge. Move our center of pivot to here. Actually, let's put our center of gravity down here. A center of gravity does not have to reside inside the object. It is quite possible, you can imagine, if you had a bar like this in your house pegged to a board, you could stick a very uh, heavy lead weight and screw it in underneath the shaft, and you've effectively done what I just did with this center of gravity, which is move it directly under the origin. So if we hit stop to reset everything and then start, you can see it's a wholly different reaction than what we had a moment ago, and it's based on the physics of what would happen with those objects. So now that all of that is said, we need to talk about how you can set the properties of an object. Um, let's take a look at adding a ball onto the screen here. Now this ball, because I've dropped it on the screen, is default is by default pegged to the back wall. Like any object you make, it will be automatically pegged to the back wall. Now you can't see that until you go into kinematic mode, but when we do, we can see we now have an origin pegging ourselves to that wall, and we have a center of gravity out here. So if I was to hit run, our balls swing off, and this ball that we have on the wall just simply swings under gravity until it finds its zero. What if we wanted that ball not to have a pivot? Well, there are a couple of property boxes up here. There is chain properties and global properties. They both do kind of the same thing with an important difference. One deals with groups, and the other deals with um, groups of groups. Um, I'll explain that in a moment, but let's just press the single group object for, for a second here. And as you can see, we're shown a great number of settings. We can select whether the object is dynamic, kinematic, or static. Dynamic means it's going to act under the influence of physics as you expect. And all objects that you normally stick on will be dynamic objects uh, at first. A kinematic object I'll ask you to ignore for now. Uh, we'll talk about it in future, but it's generally not used by you. Uh, at the moment anyway. A static object is like a floor. Uh, it means that it will not move, but it will collide with things. Uh, we could turn off a pivot to the background by unchecking this has central pivot to background box. 
hit OK, stop, and you'll notice our central pivot is now gone. If I hit run, it will now tip off to the side as you would expect under gravity. You can at any time turn off kinematics manually and then select objects if you wish to move them or put them in a different location. Uh, we turn it back on and then things will operate as, again, as you'd expect from the physics of it. Um, now we need to look at how we can join several objects and let's also use that opportunity to look at uh, how grouping works. So I'm going to stop this and select for a new project. Now I'm going to draw four bars for the heck of it, just because we can. Now these four bars do not touch and they're not actually part of the same object. You'll notice if I click one it selects and the other ones deselect. But there are times when you want one object, you can picture a wheel with several pins and latches and gadgets on it. You want them to be one. So if we select them all, right click and select group chains, they now become one object. If I click on one, they all select. And this is where the importance of the two buttons up here uh, named chain properties and global properties comes in. The chain properties is for any object and an object can be four chains in the object. Here you can see that this is bringing up and it's treating all four of these as if it's one shape. It will give you access to the individual shapes that make up that object because there are times that you don't want those shapes to collide with other types of shapes. And there we come into a collision rule. Any objects which are part any chains which are part of a single object will not collide. Chains are the individual drawings that you might have made and an object is the collective that you've joined together to group into an object. So this is one object. If I was to draw a circle over here, that is its own object because there's nothing else grouped with it. And here we have that object. So there are two objects on the screen at the moment. And if I go into simulation, and I turn it on, you can see that those four bars are indeed one object. And they will respond to gravity as you would expect. The other button, the now if I select one object, you'll see that both buttons up here are lit. The chain properties, which is single object properties, and the multiple object properties is also lit. The multiple object properties is lit so that you can individually change properties of the individual shapes within that object. If I select two objects at the same time, you'll notice the single object uh, setter is gone. The only one available is for setting individual chains of individual objects. The reason that these are group this way is because oftentimes you you're going to want to set the properties of a whole bunch of objects at once for example if we had our bunch of balls on the screen you may want to change the way gravity interacts with them and you can do that by changing bounce shape friction body energy coefficient and pivot energy coefficient we can talk about all these on the uh, mex group and discuss what effects each of these has you may want to turn off a central pivot on, on 100 objects that you have selected, and there is where you would uncheck central pivot and say update all. When you do that, they all lose their pivot at the same time. If I was to hit OK and say go, you'll notice that they're still swiveling on a pivot. This is because I haven't pressed the stop button to reset uh, the objects. If I hit stop, the objects will reset and the physics will then take effect. Now the reason that I don't automatically reset things is because if shapes are very complex, it could take the engine five or 10 seconds to reset. And you don't want to ha have to wait that five or 10 seconds every time you're uh, changing properties of groups of objects. So the rule here is anytime you're finished setting groups of objects, hit the stop button. When you do, physics takes effect and you'll notice that things just tumble away because after all, we turned off the central pivot. So I'll turn that back on, and here I can say has central pivot, update all, and now we have central pivots. But again, if I press play, uh, you'll see it all takes off because I hadn't pressed stop. Pressing stop will reset the entire conglomeration so that everything works, again, as you expect. Okay, so now let's talk about using a DXF that you may have uh, that you want to use. So I'm going to start a new project and I'm going to load a DXF. Now the DXF that I'll load here uh, is the vein from Simtar because it's a great example 
um, of how to deal with some of these objects. A, a, a vein from Simtar, for example, is a fairly complex object. Uh, it may also be fairly large when you're in inch mode, in my case. There it is there. Uh, it's way too large because it is in inch mode. So I'm going to edit this down by erasing the line around it. And then I'll drag it down so it's very small. Move it onto my inch grid, which gives me an idea of just how much I should shrink it. And then we have our Simtar. Now, this vein, as you can see, is made up of a whole bunch of chains. There are, up here in the menu, it will tell you there are 24 chains. And something else you'll notice is that they are on their own um, layer. You actually have one simulator for each layer, and you can simulate layers individually. So one of the tricks here is to make sure that you're on the layer of the item that you wish to simulate. If not, you'll be confused as to why nothing is moving. In order to show you that, uh, show you what I mean, let's do this. Now you can see things are going really crazy. Well, the reason for that is you've got a bunch of shapes. They're sitting on top of each other. There's thousands of collisions going on, and it doesn't know what to do with it. But it is simulating. If I go to the other main layer, which has no chains on it, and I hit run, nothing happens. The time is running, and nothing is moving until I switch to the layer that has our Simtar vein. Now again, our Simtar vein is going crazy, and we obviously want to do something to fix this up. So I'm going to turn off that mode, select all these items, right-click and group them. That's job one. Once we're grouped, you can see that now the Simtar vein begins to act as you'd expect. But there's a secondary issue here that you really need to concern yourself with. A lot of the shapes that you'll import from DXFs can be very complex. And in simulations, it can be very hard to uh, do collision detection on very complex objects. So you may want to decimate that down. One of the ways to do that is to select the object. And whether you use single or multiple object uh, properties is unimportant. You'll find a button in here called Decimate. And as you click through the chains you'll find some of the chains are very large uh, chain number one here for example has 937 vertices anything more than 500 vertices or so can really slow you down um, what i'd recommend doing is uh, decimating everything and the best way to do that is to use the multiple grouping because you get all buttons all through it so here i can say decimate all and all of the chains have now been decimated to a much simpler form, and yet still retained enough of their shape to be uh, visually appealing. Now you notice the circles that I was using actually became squares. So I probably decimated this too much, but let's remember that this is a simulation. It's not really meant for you to have accurately machinable objects. You can keep your original DXFs for that, uh, or you can decimate to a lower level. There, you'll notice there was a tolerance box beside my decimate button, uh, which allowed me to uh, select just how much I want to remove vertices from this object. These decimate buttons are handy for you if you want to export gears and such into Fusion 360 as well, uh, because they will decimate fairly cleanly. And as you can see, I did a heavy decimation on this object, and yet I still maintained uh, its shape generally, and it became a very small object. It does not affect the simulation of it um, other than to speed it up. The less complex your shapes are, uh, the faster things will simulate. Okay, so now we've created uh, one Gerotic uh, Simtar vein. We can copy this and paste a few of them around. And when you paste something, it pastes where your mouse was pointed when you did the paste. All right, so now we have three Simtar veins on the screen. See what happens if we turn that on. As you can see, they copy their properties. Because they were grouped and because they already knew that they had central pivots, they turn. But you notice that these two on the right uh, have spun, hit each other, and stopped. And if I grab it with my mouse, uh, clicking into an object with your mouse will allow you to pull it. And they begin to swing again. But you may not want these to touch each other. And one way to stop objects from colliding is to give them the same group number. So what I can do is I can select all three of these objects. Go up here and you'll see there's a group number. So I'm going to select group number one and update them all. 
group one objects or group any number objects uh, will not hit each other. Zero is a special group number. All zeros hit each other unless they're in the same object. All other group numbers will not hit each other uh, as long as they're not zero. So these are all group one objects, which means they cannot hit each other. And sure enough, as we go, you'll see they now go through each other. Well, this is true of Simtar because each of the veins is behind or in front of each other. So you would expect them not to hit. That would be normal. Okay, so here we have three Simtar veins and they're rotating on this backboard that we have them pegged to. But that's not really what Simtar does. So let's see if we can correct that a little bit. First of all, um, if I select these items, you can see that our origins, our center spots, are simply the center of mass of the object. So I'm going to fix that by selecting one at a time the object and moving its origin uh, to a better spot, which is where the pivot actually is. Now the center of gravity is you might want to vary between fins because when you build Simtar, you end up doing that to try to get the shape positions that you want. So now, with the proper centers and with the center of gravity set properly, you can see you get a more realistic version of what does actually happen with Simtar. But Simtar is not just pegged to a background. It's pegged on a spinning object. So let's see if we can uh, simulate that object. I'm going to hit a box just for the sake of argument so that you can see what the box does. And if I turn this on, of course, we get into trouble because the box is now colliding with the objects and pushing them out. It'll look very bad and it'll time very bad. So let's take the property of the box and make it object one as well. Here's group number one. And now the Simtar veins will not collide with that box. We hit stop to reset everything and away we go. And you can see that they, the box simply spins on its own. The two are not connected at all. But now we'll play a trick where we select all three of the Simtar veins. And I'll warn you that uh, selections are pain in the arse in this program sometimes. I'm still working on uh, making that better. But anyway, we have the three Simtars selected. So let's select the multi-group and turn off the central pivot to the background. That's this button here. And we hit update all so that they all get turned off. And we say OK. Well, let's see what the effects of it is. And I highly recommend that you check the effects each time you do something. So we press stop simulate and we hit go. Well, that's what we expected, isn't it? The square rotates and the three of them take off. And by the way, things that take off will fall for a while until they get far enough away, at which point they go to sleep. This is just to keep your program from being bogged down with too many things which have fallen away. Oh, there are also zoom buttons on the screen. If you select something, you have a button over here where you can say, show me, zoom in on what I've selected. Or you can say, zoom in on the workspace. Uh, and so on. And whatever you selected last will be your new double click location. So uh, play with those zoom buttons and with the double click and you'll get an idea of how to quickly zoom in on things. Okay, so our problem was the three veins were taking off and falling away. Well, there's a way to fix that. If we select our background box, which is pivoted to ground, and one of the veins at the same time, I'm going to hold down my control key while I select each. Now we have two of them selected and up here on the screen, uh, when you hover over this uh, red thing with an arrow, it'll say add a pivot between two objects. So rather than pivot to ground, we'll pivot between two objects. When I hit it, you'll hear a uh, jackhammer or a ratchet wrench come in and attach those two together. So this vein is now attached to the back. And if I hit the stop button, a new symbol appears. This is the uh, dual object pivot symbol. And you can grab it and move it to there. This object is now pivoted to that box. It will move with it, but it's also free to rotate on the pivot. For, as an example, let's hit stop. So you can see the effect is that that object is now pivoting on its central pivot. All right, so let's do that to all three of these. I'm going to pick that one and the background. Add a pivot, and then I'll add that one and add a pivot there. Now when I hit stop, both pivots appear. The pivots will appear halfway between the centers of the two objects. So this pivot you can be pretty sure belongs to this object because it's halfway between the center. But at times you're going to want to play or do one at a time so that you can get a better idea of exactly whose pivot you're changing.
Okay, so now we have three objects on pivots. Let's hit stop and run. And as you can see, it looks very much like what SimTire looks like when it's running. And again, with your mouse, as long as you click inside a running object, you can grab it and pull it and get some motion to it. Now, you may decide that you want to quit pulling this and just put some force on it. So let's hit stop. We can hit the background, and if we just select the one object, which is our background, up here is a picture of a motor. We can add a motor. Now the second time, the first time you push motor, you'll hear the jackhammer sound telling you that the motor has been applied. And if we hit stop, a new symbol appears. It's a set of teeth, triangles, around the central pivot. This tells you that you have a motor. So if I press motor again while I'm on that shape, it'll show us what our motor is. So let's tell our motor to give us 15 RPM with a force of 400 Newton meters. Now, the force here uh, is not a proper uh, force yet. It does not translate between metric and English. It is just at the moment 400 Newtons. Uh, so it's neither Newton meters nor Newton inches. The difference between metric and English, there is just about none at the moment, but there may be some actual uh, difference in effect. Uh, this is something I'm still straightening down. The visual diameter entry is just the diameter of these uh, pivots when they show up. You can reduce them to almost zero if you don't want to see them or make them larger if you want them to be more intrusive. We hit OK and we hit stop to reset. Always remember to hit stop. And now when we hit go, uh, the motor is now driving this object around. But we've also told that object to have gravity. And the motor at 400 newtons uh, doesn't appear to have enough power to make this a, a perfect rotation. You'll see, you may not be able to notice in the video, it's actually slowing up when the heavy part of it is going up and it speeds up a little bit when the heavy part is going down. So you can also, if you're going to motorize an object, you may want that effect, which is why it's allowed to be there. But you could also bring it up and say, responds to gravity on pivot, release that. If you do that, the motor will no longer struggle against gravity and will continue at the same speed no matter what you do. You are still capable of pulling it, but if you give the motor too much power, you won't be able to pull against it. When you grab an object and pull in a particular direction, you're actually applying a force, and the force you apply may or may not be enough depending on how much force you told your motor to have. So that's a consideration that you'll have to have. Um, let's take one quick look as a final thing in this video because I really don't want to make this video two hours long. It's going to take several videos to get through all the concepts of what we need to do here. Um, let's take a look. I'm going to hit new project just to delete all that type of stuff and I'm going to draw two circles on the screen. I'm going to select the two circles and go into kinematic mode and I'm going to click on the four bar linkage. You'll hear the same sound telling us that we've jackhammered the two things together. And if we hit the stop button, our linkage appears. You can now grab the pivots of this linkage and move them where you wish. When you hit run, it's only gravity that's making these two things run. And you'll notice that the pivot is getting shorter and smaller as you go. Hitting the stop button uh, will stop that from happening. And now the pivot is forced to be the length it is. There are more types of pivots and springs and magnets and everything else which are yet to be added and you will in the end get a type of four bar that can actually be stretched. But as you can see from this four bar linkage, uh, just moving the ends of it when you hit stop is how you um, manage to move the pivot to a new location. It is very possible to set it to a location where you will uh, freeze the object so it gets stuck. Uh, but you can always stop and reposition your object. Now, most importantly here for this video is when you come up with something that you like and it moves well, uh, you can select them all. You'll notice that the four bar linkage in this case does not select. The four bar linkage is a ghost. It doesn't really exist. It's just there to visualize the fact that you are going to join these with uh, pivot. When you select a group of objects like this, right click and say add to mechs. If you do, you'll be asked for a name. I'm going to say arts, arts bar test. And I'll hit OK. That now shows up down here in the list of mechs that we have that we can use. You'll find them in a folder called mechs uh, in your directory. They're typically quite small, and please post any on the web if you find some that are cool. Um, 
Let me start a new project. Now I'll show you how to use those. We can now say arts bar test, which we just added, and select import. You'll get a message saying Mac loaded, paste as you wish. So we can now select paste. And as you can see, nothing showed up. The screen seems a little lockish. If I uh, turn on kinematics, now they show up. Sometimes you need to turn on or off kinematics in order for the various databases to update each other so that it knows how things are running. Um, as I said, there's a lot of bugs in here and I'm still tracking them down. The program was not designed to be as complex as what we're making it and uh, there's a lot of shuffling of databases and so on going around. Anyway, I'm going to end this video here. I think I've given people enough uh, food for thought. I will be making more videos and uh, there will be a MEX uh, discussion board on the forum created today so that anyone who wishes to ask questions or uh, wishes to show us what they've done or post a MEC for us to add to the program, uh, we'll do so in that, in that spot. So, welcome to the kinematics module. I hope you have fun with it. I hope you're patient with its bugs. And uh, let's see what kind of cool stuff we can do over time.